come on everyone, I can't do this all on my own. If you want people to forever remember your game, there are many strategies you can employ. A catchy title, an engaging story, a charming world. Or you can go with the thick anime babe on the coffer approach, and you have my full attention. Once upon a time, Climax wanted to make an RPG for the Dreamcast, and they wanted to do something inspired by Japanese RPG classics. They wanted the whimsical feel of the Mana series, the sci-fi touches of Star Ocean, and a combat system that would forgo menus in favor of fast-paced real-time action. But the Dreamcast wasn't doing too well by the year 2000, so Climax moved development to the PlayStation 2 instead, and the game was called Symphony of Light, at least before grabbing the attention of Microsoft like a good pair of D-cups. Microsoft was preparing to enter the fray with the Xbox, and after seeing titles like Final Fantasy VII sell by the gazillions, they wanted a piece of that creamy pie for themselves. But there was a problem. Microsoft failed to catch the interest of Japanese developers, and the console had no future JRPGs in sight. So they partnered up with Climax and struck an exclusivity deal, eventually publishing the game in 2004 under the Microsoft Game Studios label. The final game was also supposed to be called Steki, a Japanese word meaning wonderful, but due to some communication mishaps between Climax and Microsoft, they went with Sudeki instead. Rookie mistake. Strangely enough, the 2005 PC port was never released in the United States until 2014, when it got a digital re-release. For some reason, the GOG version was delisted in 2020, but it's still available on Steam. That's the version I'm playing here, and I'll discuss some of its quirks later on. The game takes place in Sudeki, a world once ruled by the god Tetsu. Tired of governing alone, he split himself in two and Haigu was born. The Age of Unity began, but eventually the darkness inside Haigu grew stronger, and he attempted to overthrow Tetsu. With the help of four heroes, Tetsu defeated Haigu, but as a final middle finger he split the world in two before being banished into the void. The Age of Unity ended and Sudeki split into two separate worlds, Haskelia, the world of light, and Aquoria, the world of darkness. The story proper begins a thousand years later, with our unlikely hero waking up late for combat practice with General Arlo, who is his instructor and also his father. After getting his daily berating, Tao joins his fellow soldiers for a tutorial, before being given a new mission. Haskelia and Aquaria have been at war for years, and reports say that the capital city of Illumina is about to be attacked once more. The princess makes frequent visits to the town of New Brightwater, so Tao's group is instructed to go make sure that the road is clear, so that nothing goes wrong. Everything goes wrong when Tao's comrades get slain by an ogre that deploys tactical farts. Tao manages to knock it down, but he's exhausted and the beast gets back up almost immediately. Tetsu then appears and tells him that he's a descendant of one of the heroes who defeated Haigu, and grants Tao a new armor and a new power that lets him turn the ogre into chiblets. Nice. After getting roasted by his father again, Tao is instructed to go find Princess Awish in the town of New Brightwater, and to bring her back to the castle and this little trip leads to the main plot. Queen Wusika has ordered the construction of a tower that will supposedly create a magic wall that will protect the world from Aquarius attacks, but to get it up and running the tower needs the energy of magic crystals scattered throughout Haskelia. In charge of the project is Elko, a genius scientist and a good friend of Tao. The Shadani Mo tribe is reluctant to join the Queen's plans, and so the two friends are sent on a mission to bring their crystal back. 
and I have to say, I wasn't expecting to enjoy the story as much as I did. By all accounts, it shouldn't be getting any filios out of me, but I guess the world design pulls through like a g-string on a dinosaur. Part of it comes from the game generally keeping a light-hearted tone, and Haskellius Countryside is the biggest example of that, with its colorful environments and soft guitar tracks playing in the background. It has some good vibes is what I'm saying. The other part comes from the four main characters looking like walking stereotypes, yet managing to keep me engaged. I wouldn't say that any of them are original, or even well written for reasons that I'll explain in a hot minute, but their interactions are generally enjoyable, despite the voice acting not always being the best. Avish sounds like a granny sometimes, and this awkward pause between each voice line breaks the flow. But still, it's one of those stories that rely on overused tropes, yet pull them off in a surprisingly self-aware manner that makes them charming rather than just dull or uninteresting. Or at least I hope that's the intention, because otherwise I'm going to end up sounding pretty stupid. You've got Tao, a young man infinitely skilled with a blade and endlessly clumsy when it comes to family matters. Eilish, the young princess of Illumina, and a clingy stalker seconds away from pouncing on Tao. Buki, a walking weapon and member of the Shadani tribe, a race of anthropomorphs. And finally, you have Falco, a scientist with an artificial arm who is the catalyst behind the main conflict. Tao might be the closest Sudeki has to a protagonist, but you'll spend at least a third of the game without him in your party, which has interesting implications in terms of story and gameplay. Unlike most JRPGs, fighting with a full party isn't the norm. You can freely switch between your available characters at any time, but on many occasions the group will split into pairs for plot-related reasons, and each character will have to use their abilities to help each other solve various puzzles. Tao can move heavy objects, Eilish can dispel magic, Buki can climb walls, and Elko has a chat pack that lets him float for a bit. That's a doubly nice design element, because it also lets different characters have some quality time with each other, Elko and Buki being the prime example, since they stand on opposite sides of the spectrum. Elko is a scientist, so he's all about logic and hard science, while Buki and her tribe are heavily tuned to nature and spiritualism, paying their respects to one of the heroes who helped Tetsu defeat Haigu. It's an important plot point later in the story, where Elko strongly denies that destiny is a real concept. Too bad all of this got soiled by the game's rough development cycle. A large portion of the planned content got scrapped due to a lack of time and resources, resulting in a game that is blatantly unfinished. There's a ton of unused content in the game's files, and pre-release trailers show areas that are never seen in the final game, including Transentine's Aquarian counterpart. In fact, Aquaria only has a handful of areas to explore, and half of them aren't much more than areas from Haskellia with darker lighting. You will also be doing a whole damn lot of backtracking at multiple points in the game, and while I do enjoy the world, I also notice that there is a lot of padding going on. I swear to god, if I have to backtrack through the Haskellian countryside one more time, this also had severe implications in the story department, particularly with Elko. I mentioned that he denies destiny as a concept, and this puts him in direct confrontation with the rest of the party, but that conflict is never properly explored. Tetsu just appears, shoots him with his laser beam, and he instantly throws away all his beliefs. Instant character development. The game also finishes with one of the most abrupt endings possible, with Tao giving the final boss one final smack, followed by 30 seconds of the narrator saying that light beat darkness and that's it. It doesn't solve any of the remaining plot threads, it doesn't show what happened to the party, and it doesn't show what defeating the big bad did for the two worlds. 
Did Tal survive the battle? Did the other characters escape? Did Haskelia and Aquaria find peace or did they continue butting heads with each other? The closest to a proper conclusion anyone ever got is an unfinished cutscene created by one of the game's animators, who was unsatisfied with the ending. So the animator got the voice actors together one last time and made this little bonus, showing Tao and his friends heading back home. Some extra development might also have helped make the character models not look like something out of an old how to draw anime book. I'm here for spunky anime hair, not for Five Nights at a Wishes. Some of it can be blamed on hardware limitations, since the high quality 3D renders look pretty decent. But even then, they could have done a better job translating the concept art to the in-game models. And speaking of concept art, some character designs were changed dramatically during development. You can see remnants of that on the portraits, which clash with the rest of the game's assets and promotional material. Kudos to the marketing department for having their priorities straight at least. As far as the JRPG influence goes, the gameplay is rather light. It has all the standard features like equipment, items and level ups, but the RPG mechanics are fairly simple. Characters only have 4 base stats, and instead of increasing them with each level, you simply get 1 point every level to increase one stat by one step. Health increases max HP, skill increases max SP, power increases basic attack damage, and essence increases the damage of skill strikes. Each character only has a handful of weapons, and they don't necessarily function as incremental upgrades to older stuff. Many of Tao and Buki's weapons are side grades with variable amounts of damage, critical chance and rune slots, while Awish and Elko's weapons work on a different set of rules entirely. And as for armor, it is strictly acquired at preset points in the story, where Tetsu shows up and gives characters a new outfit. That's some good armor right there. The most complex it ever gets involves runes, which can be inserted into available slots on weapons and armor to provide bonuses like increased attack power or recovering HP with each hit. Where it gets more complex is in actual battles. Sudeki employs a real-time combat system split into two paradigms, melee and ranged. Tao and Buki fight with melee weapons, combining a sequence of three light and heavy attacks to perform unique combos with different properties. Some are faster but deal less damage or knock enemies down, while others are more powerful but have longer wind-ups, so you need to be careful. The buttons have to be pressed with the right timing too, or else the character will simply use a basic attack. Both characters also have a weak knockback attack that pushes back enemies, although sadly it can't be used in combos. They can also perform the standard blocking and dodge rolling to avoid damage. Awish and Elko instead fight with ranged weapons. Awish uses magic staffs and Elko uses guns, but in practice they're the same. The camera switches to first person and you control the character like you would in any first person shooter. Each weapon has its own type of attack, some of which mirror the usual arsenal you would find in your average FPS. For example, Awish's first staff quickly launches low-power projectiles, while her second starting weapon is a close-range shock that deals decent damage and hits multiple enemies, but has to spend a couple of seconds recharging. Meanwhile, Elko also starts with a railgun that pierces enemies. All characters can also trigger two kinds of special abilities, skill strikes and spirit strikes. The former expands the character's SP to unleash various offensive and support skills. Some are instant, like Awish's Healing Kiss, while others, such as Tao's Shin Splitter, slow down the game for a few seconds while you move around to target the enemies you want. Spirit Strikes instead require building up a bar by fighting enemies. 
During certain story moments, each character will learn two spirit strikes. One that spends half of the bar to provide a powerful stat bonus, and one that spends all of it to deliver a powerful attack capable of annihilating every enemy with obnoxious amounts of motion blur. This game really likes its motion blur. This all sounds great in theory, but it suffers from the bane of the sixth console generation action game. Melee combat that is sheer concentrated clunk. Maybe I've been spoiled by Devil May Cry and Chaos Legion, but boy this is crusty. Tal and Buki's attacks have long windups and even longer recovery times, and you can't adjust direction or cancel into a dodge while the animation plays, so you have to commit to every strike. This would be fine if enemies weren't fast and could move out of the way without a problem. It's common for enemies to stagger the player by simply hitting you in the face while you're busy spinning like Sonic the Hedgehog. Enemies might be dumb, but late game you fight large groups, and most of them have attacks fast enough to hit you while you're still stuck in your animation. It's especially bad with a certain late game enemy that carries a shield and is very resistant to staggering, which means that it will shrug off your attacks and keep doing whatever it's doing, such as bashing your face in. There's also no flow to your movements, so you can't smoothly transition from one combo to the next. So even though you have attacks that do things like launching enemies into the air, there's nothing interesting you can do with that. The only truly reliable combo is the juggling attacks, because they can be extended, deal more damage than the powerful single hit attacks, and you can stun lock most enemies with them. I can taste the cheese. The result is that you have a ton of variety, yet most of it is useless or even detrimental, and a considerable portion of the playtime is left thoroughly unsatisfying. Watching enemies explode into jibs after a spirit strike is about as good as it gets. Boss battles don't fare much better, with the prime strategy being to bait them into doing their dumb slow attacks so you can safely get a couple of hits in there, else you're getting a luxury cruise to the graveyard. It's very dull. The game showers the player in healing items, and spirit strikes effectively let you skip some battles, so it's not like getting past the combat is hard. It's just that it doesn't feel rewarding when you overcome obstacles by spamming potions and Eilish's potty mouth rather than through skill and strategy. A manual lock-on could alleviate these problems, but it doesn't have one, I think. It's listed in the controller settings as the left shoulder button, which does nothing, while the keyboard settings don't even mention it. The Xbox manual also doesn't mention it, so I'm assuming that was a mistake. But it's bizarre when you consider that the PC port came a year later, so the developers deliberately added that listing to a brand new menu that obviously didn't exist before. Could they have planned to add stuff that the Xbox version lacked due to time constraints? Who knows. Ok, but what about Awish and Elko? Well, you point and shoot, step back when necessary and that's it. The weapons are all functional, but they don't feel very good to shoot, and most of them deal pistol damage or take way too long to recharge between shots to be useful. Though you can chase enemies with them, slowly as if wading through water, in a really subpar FPS. Enemies have dumb slow AI too, and for god knows why, these two characters move forward extremely fast in first person, making it very easy to dodge everything, as if just strafing backwards didn't already get you 95% of the way there. Real high level play, I can feel my neurons activating. In all seriousness, combat is arguably the worst part of the game, and having to engage with it every few minutes puts a damper on the experience. It's not unplayable, but it really does not feel good. The balance is also a bit whack early on, due to the way enemy damage and player HP scales. The 500 HP that Tao starts with sounds like a lot, but enemies can chip off a good chunk with a single attack, and the first boss will do it in 2 or 3. It can also fart poison, which will drop Tao down to zero in less than a minute. 
but at the same time, Tal's HP upgrades grant him 500 HP each, so investing a single point will instantly double his survivability in the early game. So upgrade health at the start, or you're gonna have a bad time. There's this particularly frustrating dungeon in the early game, where the party splits in two and has to fight spiders that poison your characters on hit. You don't have the resources to deal with getting poisoned every battle, but because the combat is so stiff and clunky, that's not just a possibility, it's inevitable. As for the quirks with the PC port, it has to do with frame rate. The game technically supports frame rates above 60, but letting it do so causes a few problems. The main one is the camera, which functions fine during combat and most cutscenes, but will fail to adjust correctly whenever you go up or down. It's very apparent whenever you move up a slope, since the camera starts bumping into the ground. Given the female designs, you might almost think this was intentional, but no. The second problem is that a handful of cutscenes can have objects behaving weirdly, which depending on how you view it, is either hilarious or it ruins some emotional moments. Or both. The good news is that neither of these problems are game-breaking, just mildly annoying, which is why I still played it at a higher frame rate. The camera problem can be easily worked around by switching to the first-person view and back, while the cutscene weirdness only shows up in a handful of them. Regardless, the fix is very simple, just limit the game to 60 FPS. To be fair, the launcher lets you easily pick a refresh rate, but it also gives you no warning, so while I might be splitting hairs like a spoiled PC gamer over here, I'm still docking points for it. The camera issues could also have been minimized if the game would just let you rotate it vertically instead of just horizontally. Instead it just lets you zoom in and out a bit. It also goes without saying that you can play the game with mouse and keyboard, but a controller is very much recommended. Wouldn't want to make combat any more painful than it already is. Still, I can see why someone might look back on this game fondly for more than just Elish's chest cannons. I'd love to see this game get a remake, or at least a remaster. It's very unlikely, but not impossible, since Climax continues to exist to this day, despite not making that much of a splash anywhere. Sudeki isn't much more than a footnote in the original Xbox's history, but it is one of the few original IPs that Climax has worked on between churning out licensed games or helping port games to other platforms, and it's clear that the team was really excited about it back then. But apparently the rights to the Sudeki IP belong to Microsoft, not Climax. And I know that it would be a huge undertaking for a game that didn't sell very well. But hey, it's 6 euros on Steam, so it's not the worst thing in the world to spend your money on. Just mildly frustrating sometimes, charmingly cheesy others, and forever unfinished.